A journey to ancient Pompeii. All that is left to us of man's early history, from the beginning of time to the present day, are sparse traces, signs, indications, fragments of a vast mosaic which scholars seek to put together with slow and painstaking work, but which always remains incomplete. If we reflect on how difficult it is to reconstruct the ancient past from the scant evidence we have, we may begin to understand why the discovery of the ancient city of Pompeii is probably the luckiest and most extraordinary event in the whole history of archaeology. 2,000 years ago, Pompeii was inhabited by nearly 20,000 people. It was a prosperous provincial city where men and women actively engaged in work, business, politics, games and entertainment, carrying on an intense, lively and probably happy existence. One day, all this suddenly came to a stop. In the short span of a few dramatic hours, the entire city with its inhabitants was buried under a layer of red-hot ash and stones which poured on them from the deadly volcano, Vesuvius. Houses, streets, squares, temples, theatres, shops, furniture, silverware, graffiti, frescoes, the very bodies of the people, their clothes, their features, the desperate expressions on their faces in the culminating instances of their tragedy. All this was preserved by a layer of ash for nearly 2,000 years and is now offered for us to see, leaving us awed, moved and impressed. Pompeii was founded around the middle of the 6th century BC by a strand of the Oshi, one of the oldest of the Italic people. At the start, it was a small village of peasants and fishermen, but thanks to its favorable position at the mouth of the river Sarno and to the fertility of the volcanic soil, it enjoyed a constant growth in size and population. Thus, the village gradually turned into a small city, which engaged in trading with the Greek colonies of southern Italy, by whom it was politically and culturally influenced, as we can see in the vases which adorned the Temple of Apollo. Other vase fragments bearing Etruscan inscriptions are proof of the contacts between the Pompeians and the Etruscans which around the end of the 6th century BC dominated part of the region of Campania in southern Italy. During this first period, a broad perimeter of walls was built, but the actual city was probably limited to the area close to the Forum Piazza and to that of the so-called Triangular Forum and was characterized by small, modest buildings gathered in blocks and intersected by curving alleys. This was a peaceful period of gradual growth for Pompeii, which lasted till the 5th century BC, when the city was conquered, along with the entire plain of Campania, by the Samnites, a fierce population from the Apennine region of Isernia. During the Samnite period, Pompeii again enjoyed a long period of economic prosperity and urban growth, along with a significant increase in the quantity and quality of its artistic production.
Thanks to the presence nearby of important centres such as Neapolis and Capua, and to the fact that its harbour at the mouth of the river Sarno served also the neighbouring cities of Nola, Acerra and Nuceria, the Pompeians could successfully dedicate themselves to trading, artisanship and industry, in the limited sense which this word had at the time. At the end of the 4th century BC, new blocks were built, intersected by wide and regular streets. An imposing entrance with ionic columns was added to the triangular forum, along with a Doric colonnade in the inner area. The old temple of Hercules was also rebuilt. Some public buildings were renovated or embellished, like the Temple of Apollo, one of the oldest in the city. New ones were erected, such as the Temple of Jupiter and the majestic Basilica, the seat of the law courts and the Campidoglio. The entire Forum Square was adorned with porticos of Doric columns. Meanwhile, the long wars of Rome against the Samnites were coming to an end, and Pompeii, a Samnite city, became an ally of Rome. Although maintaining its administrative autonomy, the Osco-Samnite language and its ancient civil and religious traditions. The Samnite period was also characterized by an intense growth in private housing. The House of the Faun was erected over the foundations of a pre-existing 5th century building. It is a palace of impressive size and has an extremely elegant architectural structure characterized by a variety of spaces, colonnades, inner courtyards and gardens. Its marvelous pavements, adorned with enormous mosaics, made up of millions of colored pieces. surely one of the most splendid ancient buildings ever discovered. Buildings such as the House of the Faun or the House of the Tragic Poet are proof of the significant development of Samnite Pompeii and suggest the lifestyle of its rich and sophisticated aristocracy centered around a harmonic relationship with nature. The house is not conceived as an artificial isolated world. On the contrary, nature is incorporated in the ample inner gardens. A new period in the history of Pompeii began in the year 89 BC, when the city rebelled against Roman rule and was consequently besieged and conquered by Sulla and made into a Roman colony. New neighborhoods were created to house the troops which Sulla had decided to station in the city, along with a number of Roman families who decided to move to Pompeii. The process of integration between the old Samnite inhabitants and the new colonizers turned out to be relatively speedy and peaceful. Beginning in the year 89 BC, Pompeii began to take on the typical aspect of a Roman city, although retaining some degree of administrative autonomy. This was symbolically represented by the Forum, the true political heart of the city, where the majority of public activities took place.
These were the buildings where the city's administration was located. At the center was the Curia, where archives were kept and the Ordo de Curionum had its seat. This order was a sort of supreme city council whose purpose was to direct the activity of the city administrators, the two Duumviri and the Aediles. The Duumviri had their seat here on the right-hand side. The true rulers of the city being responsible for the city's budget, taxes, and the more important decisions on roads and public and sacred buildings. On the left-hand side is the office of the Aediles, which were responsible for less important matters such as the administration of the local market, the maintenance of streets and public buildings, and the organization of the urban and rural police forces. The forum was also the place where the population at large would occasionally gather to vote on the proposals of its rulers. The people of Pompeii were passionately engaged in politics. Every five years in the spring, the appointment of the new Duumviri was preceded by a veritable electoral campaign. Men and women, single citizens, families, work guilds, neighborhood committees all campaigned for a given candidate. City walls, house and shop entrances are still covered with electoral slogans, authentic pieces of political propaganda signed by the candidate's supporters. Over 2,800 inscriptions of this kind have been found. Such was the interest in politics and the fierceness of the competition that the great Cicero ironically wrote that it was easier to become a senator in Rome than a city councillor in Pompeii. Of course, the supreme governor of the city remained the Roman emperor, who was revered by the Pompeians as a god on earth. According to current mythology, Venus, protector of the city, was the lover of Mars, the god of war, who was the father of Romulus, the founder of Rome, and the first of the Roman rulers. Thus, in Pompeii, the cult of the emperor was at the root of public and religious life, and found material expression in the most important site of the city, the Forum, at the center of which was an enormous statue of Augustus, flanked by a similar one representing Claudius, and by another of Agrippina. Moving to the forefront, we find a smaller one of Nero on horseback, and in the corners, the pedestals of statues that have never been found. Although the greater part of their tributes were reserved for the emperor, the Pompeians revered many divinities, and like all ancient populations, were imbued with a strong sense of the sacred. The religious spirit of the Pompeian people is reflected in the countless domestic altars dedicated to the cult of their ancestors and other divinities who protected the home. It is also evident in the many public temples dedicated to Greek and Oriental divinities which coexisted with the ones consecrated to the gods of the official Roman religion. This heterogeneity was the product of the gradual juxtaposition of the Oriental, Greek, and Roman religions, and of the rural traditions of the Samnites who revered the gods of nature and fertility. It is not always easy to understand the true significance of what we see. This fresco, perhaps the most famous painting of the ancient world, from which the Villa of the Mysteries takes its name, represents various moments in the initiation of a woman to the rites of a secret and forbidden cult, the Dionysian Mysteries.
Yet in observing the intense life of ancient Pompeii, this city so passionately involved in religion, politics and the arts, what strikes one most is perhaps the extraordinary commercial and productive vitality of its inhabitants. Rome's absolute dominion over the Mediterranean created extremely favorable conditions for the development of trading by sea and the entire economy of Pompeii took advantage of this. The many rural villas around the city produced excellent wines, great quantities of olive oil, cereals and flour, all of which was often exported. Bread was produced in what can only be defined as an industrial fashion, given the number and size of the bakeries. All the various cycles of the cloth industry took place in Pompeii. The abundant flocks of sheep from the surrounding countryside provided raw wool, which was warm washed, then combed and spun. Wool strands were dyed in brilliant colors, usually purple and yellow, and then woven into cloth. In workshops such as these, the cloth was shrunk by immersion in a special fluid and then milled, undergoing a complex process which resulted in a stronger and thicker end product. The need to ship goods stimulated the growth of the ceramic industry, which besides providing the containers for wine and fish sauce, also produced bricks and tiles for the building industry, oil lamps and pottery of all sorts. Trade remained the vital core of the Pompeian economy thanks to the strategic position of the city. This monumental building overlooking the Forum was probably something akin to a modern wholesale commercial center for woolen products, or perhaps even a wool exchange, where products were exhibited and business transactions took place. Other products were traded in the nearby food market, a building of considerable size. On the streets, where we find public fountains and pedestrian crossings, particularly useful on rainy days, there is evidence of intense cart traffic and of numerous shops offering all sorts of merchandise, as for example here on Via della Bondanza, the street of abundance. Particularly significant are the many thermopolia, similar to our modern day cafes, where hot and cold drinks were served. Also noticeable is the presence of inns where food and lodgings were provided. Their high number confirms the fact that the city was often frequented by foreigners, mainly traders from other towns, both near and far. But there were also occasional visitors attracted by the numerous sports and theatrical events, not to mention the many prostitutes offering all sorts of carnal pleasures, as shown by these crude paintings found in a brothel. The Pompeii revealed to us now, that of the first century BC, was therefore a true city, bustling and vital, whose commercial and industrial prosperity is evidenced by the many private mansions we see as we wander around its streets, houses that compete for beauty and elegance, which are occasionally surprisingly lavish, as in the case of the House of the Vetti, where we find these splendid wall decorations that help us understand the spirit of the people of Pompeii their intimate and intense relationship with nature. Pompeii was part of a complex, civilized, and sophisticated world. This flourishing town contained a huge outdoor theater, which could seat 5,000 spectators, where we can imagine them watching Plautus and Menandro's comedies, 
or the Attilani, popular farces traditional in Campania, as well as mime and dance shows. And for recitals of poetry and music, there was the Odeon, the small, intimate and elegant roofed theatre. Other shows dear to Pompeians were duels between gladiators or between gladiators and wild animals that were held in the great amphitheater, the oldest one ever discovered, where an immense crowd of nearly 20,000 people, men and women from Pompeii and neighboring towns, would enthusiastically attend the games. These shows were cruel and ruthless, often arousing the spectators' basest instincts, and as in modern stadiums, fights often broke out. In the year 59 AD, the incidents between the rival fans of Pompeii and Nuceria were so violent and produced such a high number of dead and wounded that the Roman Senate forbade the games and closed the amphitheater for a period of 10 years. Pompeians had a great respect for physical fitness and the virtues of strength and dexterity believing in the importance of exercise for the harmonious and healthy development of the body. In Pompeii, two gymnasiums have been found, one of considerable dimensions, where young men exercised, practicing running, discus throwing, wrestling and riding. The city also sported four thermal baths, very elegant and fashionable with separate sections for men and women, all equipped with sophisticated heating systems for the rooms and pools where the Pompeians could enjoy warm and cold baths, massages and aesthetic cures. Baths and saunas were also found in many private homes, like the house of Menandro, a poet particularly dear to the Pompeians, whom the owner had depicted in a fresco. The floors of the house are also covered in elegant mosaics, But sheer love of beauty is sufficient to explain the great number of decorations, paintings and frescoes which fill the halls and the gardens and are sometimes found even in the smallest and humblest rooms of these houses. Yet there is something beyond their passion for sports or politics, beyond their artistic interests, beyond even their religious spirit, which helps us more than anything else to understand the spirit of the people of Pompeii their most intimate feelings, their tender and delicate sensuality. Here are some of the many amusing, charming and romantic graffiti scribbled on the walls around the city by numerous anonymous writers. Do not forget me, my queen. I beg you in the name of Venus. Lovers like bees want their life to be as sweet as honey. He who seeks to scold lovers might as well try to stop the winds. Love, like a rushing torrent, overcomes anything in its way. How I would like to keep your beloved arms around my neck and go on kissing your lips. Go now, my little child. Believe me, man's nature is ephemeral. As Venus has joined the bodies of lovers, so must the light of day divide them. These singularly delicate expressions reveal to us the intimate nature of these people, their culture and their human feelings, bringing them closer to our modern sensibility. But blind, capricious fortune, even while respectfully revered by these people, one day turned its back on them. On February the 5th of the year 62 AD, a violent earthquake hit the city, flattening the greater part of its houses and public buildings. It was a serious blow for Pompeii. 
nothing was left as before. And the city's new look was marked by the ruins of its temples and its palaces. Thus began the difficult effort to rebuild the city. The age of gold, of pleasure and happiness, was followed by the age of iron, of hardship and suffering. As the years went by, however, Pompeii gradually regained its former vitality. An army of workers, bricklayers, carpenters and cabinet makers, set to work in the city and innumerable working sites were opened. Houses and villas were rebuilt, as was the Temple of Isis, and the renovation of the Forum also began. But just at the moment when the city seemed able to overcome the hostility of nature, a new and terrible natural tragedy hit it, forever sealing its destiny. It is August the 24th of the year 79 AD. Vesuvius, the big verdant mountain which nobody suspects of being a volcano, is about to reawaken. It is almost noon, yet there is no sign whatsoever of the imminent eruption. In the streets and in the houses, people are busy with their usual occupations. The terrifying roar of the exploding Vesuvius takes them by surprise. The earth trembles, and a short while later, a shower of burning gases and molten rocks fall on the desperate people amid the crumbling buildings. It is one of the worst natural catastrophes ever recorded by history. In the short span of two hours, the entire city of Pompeii is completely buried under a deadly shroud of ashes, six meters deep, and every form of life is completely extinguished. The livid dawn of the following day found no sign of Pompeii. The city had vanished from the face of the earth, along with the neighboring towns of Herculaneum and Stabiae. Thus the god's folly set an end to the story of this extraordinary city. Today, these rigid bodies, their desperate or sometimes resigned expressions, awake in us an indefinable feeling of anguish and compassion. They invite us to meditate on the ephemeral nature of man, but at the same time, they make us reflect on the deepest meanings of life. All this makes Pompeii a unique place existing out of time, a magic crossroads where the past merges with the present and the future, a city full of life, eternal and immortal.